Good evening. Chaye Sarah. When a parsha is called by the life of someone, um, by some law of reversals, um, you know that it's going to be about the death of someone. Yes. Uh, when we talk about a life's work, we don't usually talk about a life's work when someone is in youth. It's when, it's when they're older that we talk about a life's work. Now, the life of Sarah gives its name to the Parsha, formally, because that's what the first Pasuk gives us. If you have a look at the beginning of the Parsha, otherwise, if you don't have a, a Chumash, just, I'll, uh, you'll follow. The life of Sarah was 100 years, 20 years, 7 years, in three blocks. In other words, count it up for yourselves, you, got it, you understand. These were the years of the life of Sarah. Now, no, one's el no one else's life is described in that way. Not even Avraham. In separate blocks, and then the repetition of the years of the life of Sarah. It's a kind of repetition, really, of the essence of the first part as if to give you a sense that there is the number of years of her life and then there's something else, there's the years of her life. Uh, it falls into some kind of parallel statement. And then what we read afterwards is that she died, which is, we are, is not unexpected once you hear the number of years. Now, the whole Parsha, I want to say, is about the problem of Sarah's life. It's not just about the number of years she lived, obviously. That's just a way of getting into the subject of her death. And then, past that fact of her death, what is the meaning of her death? It actually, what, what were the conditions under which she died? What was the circumstance under which she died? And there is amazing and difficult and traumatic, I would say, I'd go as far mm -hmm. as to say, traumatic material in the Midrash, going right inside the experience of death, the experience of dying. What, what was it for Sarah to die in the particular circumstances in which she died? Now that's not something that one usually thinks that the Torah is interested in conveying. The Torah is interested, at least from the common sense, rather externalized point of view, the Torah is interested in telling you what happened and what one can learn from it and how one should live and so on. But what I'm going to be doing, as I've been doing the last few weeks, is assuming that there is sense and there is sensibility. <laughs> that is, there is the common sense way of reading the text, and then there is the uncommon sense way of reading the text, which we, we, by which I mean having to do with the actual sensibility of people, the inner lives of human beings. Why should that be taboo from the Book of God? Yes. The Book of God should be dealing, if at all, with the, inner, the deepest aspects of the inner lives, the private lives of people. And I have to say that I, whenever I teach this, and I'm always drawn to teach it for some reason, uh, when we come to this Parsha, I'm drawn to teach this material. Uh, I feel I should issue a trigger warning of some kind because people have different sensibilities. And I'm talking to people and I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know what there is in this room. I don't know who has, whose experience in some way could be, be, be resonate with the material in such a way as to be very upsetting, to put it, to put it mildly. Um, and I'm just, so now I'm just issuing something like this trigger warning because I myself feel awkward when I start teaching this material because I know I'm going to be telling a traumatic story. And it's a story not only about the traumatic death of Sarah, but actually who dies, according to Rashi, as a result of a telling of the story. That is, she is told a story by... Well, we'll find out soon whom. She's told a story about the Akedah that kills her. Put it, put it very starkly. Not only that, but I am now telling a story, and it's a story of tremendous, uh, tremendous power and tremendous pain. And it's difficult to tell such stories. There are ethical questions also that are around telling such stories. Why would one do this? Is it ethically right 
to tell the story in a certain way. Right? So there are ways of telling stories that are not so ethical. Perhaps one shouldn't tell the story that way. When one tells a story, there's the question of how not to, be to betray the past. Now, we start off, perhaps, in Jewish tradition by being very optimistic about stories. We, we, we privilege stories, as they say. We think stories are a very good thing. Um, but as like all simple statements, uh, it's not so simple. We tell the story of Yetziat Mitzrayim, of the Exodus, and it's actually a mitzvah to tell the story. That's what you're supposed to be doing, um, in a way, every day, and uh, certainly on the night of Pesach. But there are ways of telling the story that we notice that Chazal don't really emphasize. They don't, they don't go into, for instance, on the whole, unless you know where to find these particular midrashim there too, on the whole, they don't go into the atrocities of Egypt. Like Lahavdil, I don't know if Lahavdil or not, um, like reading Holocaust literature. How much does the literature enter into the truth? And the truth is traumatic. You know, if, you, if you read the atrocities, you know, is it a responsible thing to, to, to do that to, to people, to, to, to tell them these things? Maybe one is, in a way, betraying the past sometimes by telling the truth on a certain level. You lose any sense of a larger meaning. You lose any sense of hope when you tell the story in this traumatic way. And I am not going to be trying very hard to cover up what the Midrash is saying. Shall we put it like that? I am going to actually be dealing with it with, with the seriousness that I think Chazal intend. With these caveats, you know, with the uneasiness that goes around it. Um, and with that, by way of introduction, let's go straight into the material. And what we have here, then, is a parsha that actually has two stories. Two major stories. One is the death of Sarah, that very private question, then, that we'll go into of how she died. What was her experience just before she died? What happened? And that followed by a public story of the burial of Sarah. So in other words, a death has a very private, intimate, almost untellable aspect to it, which no one, can, perhaps no one can know actually, except the person herself. Uh, and then there's the public aspect, the practical aspect. There's the burial, there are mitzvot. There are various commandments to be fulfilled, burying the dead. The story here of Avraham in a very externalized social way. He goes and he negotiates for a field and for the, the, the cave within the field, the cave that's called Ma'arata Machpila, as a burial place for his dead, Meto, for his dead, and, of course, for the generations of the Avot, of the patriarchs. Um, negotiating is a very public social thing. Uh, everyone has interests, and people cover up their interests, and it's, it's really quite fun to read. Uh, I remember from childhood, um, my father, Zechorna <laughs> Levracha, uh, emphasized the fun part of it. In other words, what, he, what Ephron is hiding when he behaves so very generously, uh, and so on. It's, it's a piece of life. It's a kind of satirical slice of life, you might say. Very different from the private story of her dying. But that's all one story, let's say. And then there's the other half of the parsha about the marrying, right? There's a dying story and there's a marrying story. And clearly it's death and life. That's the balance of the parsha. And the marrying story about how Avraham tells his servant to go and find a, an appropriate wife for his son. Um, and then a very long chapter dealing with the, the servant's journey, uh, goes back to Avraham's place of origin and stands by the well there and, and talks to God and makes an arrangement with God of some kind. I'll say this and she'll say that. And what do you know? The right girl comes out and she says the right words. I'm, I'm really cutting it very short here because we're going to be looking at it more a little later. And the end of it is that uh, the bride, an appropriate bride, the, the bride, a bride, is brought back to Yitzchak. The servant is successful in his journey. 
and he brings her back, and the bride and groom meet, and un again, under some kind of strange circumstances, you remember what the bride does when she first sees the bridegroom? What's her immediate reaction to seeing the bridegroom? She falls off her, cap off her camel. Now, that is quite dramatic, not to say maybe slightly humorous even. You know, it's like, what's this sudden collapse? Is that what's called falling in love? You know, li literally? Um, the French call it coup de foudre, uh, falling in love. The first, the first uh, glimpse of the other person, the eyes meeting across a crowded room and all that. Yes, so that's called coup de foudre, which means a shot of, of thunder. You know, suddenly there's a clap of thunder, of some, something shocking. There's something shocking that happens when she sees the Yitzchak for the first time. It's apparently not mutual because he doesn't even really see her. But that's again, just a little side comment. If you look at what, how the Torah tells the story, he lifts up his eyes and he sees the camels. <laughs> um, apparently he's somewhere else. Apparently he's thinking and he's doing something else. We'll, we'll, he's preoccupied. Um, and that says something about him. It will come, I hope, we'll be able to get to it. But she falls off the camel. She, she receives some kind of shock when she sees him. And then the final moment is of the chapter, this very long 67 verses chapter. It, it's, it probably is the longest chapter, I'm guessing. It's well, certainly one of the longest chapters in Torah. Very long chapter. How does it end? So the, bride married, the bridegroom marries the bride. Vayivieha ohela Sarah imo. He brings her into the tent of Sarah, his mother. And vayatihilo leisha. She becomes a wife to him. And he marries her. Sorry. And he loves her. Vayihaveha. In that order, as all the sermons, you know, the rabbis want to tell the young, young people. You know, you, you, you marry first, and then the important thing is the love that comes afterwards. So I hope you're all taking notes, and, and you, you know exactly how to do it. Um, love comes after marriage, but then quite seriously, jokes apart, Vayinachim Yitzchak acharei imo. And he was comforted after his mother. And at this point, suddenly the two stories come together. The dying story, we, we thought we had forgotten about the dying story. Maybe there's a relief in leaving it behind. When you see the material, you'll understand what I mean. There's a relief in leaving that story behind and going into the more cheerful business of finding a wife. You know, that's, that's life business. But it turns out that in a sense, the climax of that mar marrying story is that Yitzchak is comforted after his mother, which means that in some sense, Yitzchak, who you notice, has been totally absent from this text, from the parsha up to now. He has been talked about as the son of Avraham, as the bridegroom that we need to find a bride for. But he is not an agent in the story. He doesn't appear in the story. As far as we know, he could have been abroad at this time. You know, and his father is trying to. And suddenly he makes an appearance. And the question is, what was he doing between the Akedah and the moment when he meets his bride, when he, when he marries his wife. If only now he's comforted after the death of his mother. How long has elapsed? What does it mean to make that statement in such a forceful way that he was comforted? And now the two stories are brought face to face in some way. I'm not allowed to forget the traumatic material which I have yet, go and yet going to put in front of you. Um, but in rather, it comes and it has a very strong intrusion into the marrying story, as if the mar marrying of the wife and the, the death of the mother have something to do with each other. Now, Sarah and Rivka never meet. Yeah, <coughs> obviously. Yeah, Sarah dies. The only place they meet, apparently, is in Yitzhak's mind in Yitzchak's inner world, because he, in some way it emerges that he was unconsoled, inconsolable for his mother, and now comes his wife and shifts him to a different key somehow, it allows for comfort, that now there is some possibility of uh, thinking a little differently. One kind of thinking had been his when he was 
after his mother's death. And now he can shift into that other mode, which is called loving one's wife. So it's a, it's a, now this, if, if this sounds Freudian, um, it certainly is. And it becomes more Freudian when we look at the Midrashic sources. Have a look now at number two on your page. Let's see Rashi. Incidentally, so that I, I, I say it and don't forget to say it, um, the, the cave of burial in the field, Marata Machpela, the double cave, Machpela, Kaful, in some sense, is connected with the fact that the, the rabbis call this parsha, the marrying story, the marrying story, they call it Parsha Kfula. It's a double story. Because, this is the detail I want to mention now, when, when the servant has recognized the girl at the well, and he goes to her family, he then insists on telling the story all over again. And we have to read the story, as it were, twice. It's, it's not summed up. It's not you know, conveniently summed up for us. We hear every, you know, every, every bit, or every word of his story. And so you have, in a sense, a doubled narrative. We heard about it in real time, and then we heard about it in Yitzchak's narrative, in, in, the, in the servant's narrative. Okay. Now, that doubling, let's say, there's a lot of doubling in this parsha. Things coming in twos. Uh, one of them is the two stories, the two major stories, the dying and the... Why is it important to find a wife for the son? Well, clearly it has something to do with the death of the mother. And the most common sense level, on the anthropological level, you might say, uh, the death of the previous generation, the death of at least half of the previous generation, makes the, remain, the, the survivor of the, Avraham um, very aware that he has, to, he has to make for continuation, for continuity. He has to provide for his son to carry on because this generation is ending. And indeed, the parsha that begins with the death of Sarah ends with the death of Avraham. So there's something very symmetrical about it, as if a kind of dying, the, the, the readiness to leave the world in one way or another is initiated at the beginning and then closed at the ending, and Avram's death seems to be a much more peaceful and, and, re and reconciled death. It's a different, different kind of death. Now have a look at Rashi. Rashi is going to be saying, ultimately, that there's much more of a connection between the death of the mother and the marrying of the wife than that, than just the need to, to supply a future, a future for the family. It goes into the inner world. So this is where we begin. Ha'ohela Sara imo. Yitzchak took Rivka into the tent of Sarah, his mother. Right? You may say that's the, uh, that's the legacy of his mother. He brought her into the tent, Ha'ohela, and she became a version of Sarah, his mother. Now that's startling. As if Rivka is like Sarah. Now, she's actually not at all like Sarah. You know, if you've studied these, these texts, she, you, know, you know the way Rivka acts and you know the way Sarah acts. They're not like each other. And in the typologies of Kabbalah, and even to the point of popular, popular uh, chassidut, it's understood that Rivka is not Sarah. That, that Sarah, that Rivka is chesed. Rivka is loving kindness, how she offers water, not only to, to the servant, but to his camels, that kind of outgoingness, and in that she's like Avraham. She belongs with Avraham. Sarah stands for almost the opposite principle. She's very inward. We hardly ever hear her talking, and when she does talk, she talks in a, in a way that's not so easy to hear. It's not, it's not um, connective. For instance, send Hagar away, you know, where she insists on, on getting rid. Or when she says, I didn't laugh, you know, she laughs and she says, I didn't laugh. It's not so immediately appealing to connect with Sarah. Sarah is more inward. So here, what do, we, what, what do we have here? That he brought her into the tent, and in some sense, she becomes like a version of Sarah, his mother. Where does that come from in the text? It comes from grammatic, it's just grammar. Ha'ohela, 
it means into the tent. Right? It could really just be ha-ohel. The hay at the end gives you a sense of direction, brings her into the tent. But what's very clear is that it doesn't mean into the tent of, what's called the construct form. For that, you would have to have ohel sara. He brought her into the ohel sara. So what you actually have that Rashi is sensitive to here is a kind of break in the sentence. He brought her into the tent, colon. You have to stop there, ha-ohela. And then Sarah, his mother, is left after the colon, implying that that's the object that he brought into the tent. He brought Rivka into the tent, and in some way she changed before his eyes in, into a kind of Sarah. But dugmat Sarah means it doesn't, it's not exactly, it's not a, a facsimile of, 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 uh, of Sarah. And then Rashi says it even more clearly, in case you didn't quite get it. He says, Vaharehi Sarah Imo. And suddenly, Rivka is Sarah, his mother. And again, not meaning that she's the same kind of person, but in some way, she evokes, she evokes an experience. She, she is a phenomenon. Right? Everything, what the phenomena that were Sarah have gone, and now Rivka evokes some of the same phenomena in Yitzhak's experience of the tent, or what it means to be in the tent that has been, has been vacated. And Rashi puts it down to the three signs of that, that a woman is in residence. Um, there was a light lit from Erev Shabbat to Erev Shabbat when Sarah was alive. That is, there was a constant sense of light. It's not Sarah as a personality, it's Sarah as a phenomenon around whom one senses energy and light. That's what, as far as Yitzchak knew. And also, there was a blessing found in the dough. That is, the dough was always rising in the tent. Now, what a wonderful image. You know, there is light, and there is rising dough with a smell that goes with it, with a sense of life and future and hope that comes with it. And there was a cloud attached to the tent, perhaps a sense of a spirituality, a connection with the, with the higher world of some kind. Three phenomena, as soon as Sarah died, pasku, they stopped. It's very absolute. They stopped, ukashabat Rivka, they returned. When Rivka arrived, they returned. So what, in what way is Rivka like Sarah? not in personality, but in Yitzchak's experience of what it is to be in that place, the Sarah place. The Sarah place was somehow it went dead after she died, and it comes alive again when Rivka is there. So I, I don't want to, 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 to speculate more about this, because we will see in a moment a very interesting uh, Midrash, the Midrash Agadol, that goes further. But let's, let's look at the last bit in Rashi. He was comforted after his mother. Derech Eretz, Rashi says. It's not, this is not, Derech Eretz sometimes means it's, uh, it's polite, politeness. But here it means it's just the way of the world. It's the way of the world. It's the psychological comment he's going to make. We've seen this. As long as a man's mother is kayemet, is in existence, it's not exactly alive, I want to suggest. As long as she is in existence, karuchu etzla, he is entangled with her, enmeshed with her. Karuch is complicated. You know, it's not just that he's attached to her, but it, there's a complex. If I say complicated, you know, Freud talked about that complex, you know, the Oedipal complex. And this is one of the places, and it's not the only place, where Midrash, Targum, refers to this phenomenon that Freud put out there. He wasn't the first person to recognize it. He, he, he made it the, the, the cornerstone of, of a whole view of human nature. But, but uh, here it is. As long as a man's mother is in existence, he is in some way tied up with her. And when she dies, she, he comforts himself with his wife. Now, Rashi is saying this as a generalization. This is not just Yitzchak. This is the way it is in the world. Sons and mothers and wives. 
take it as, as it's written, and it doesn't make clear whether this is when the son is already married before his mother died or whether he marries after his mother dies. If he's already married while his mother is alive, then it would suggest a phenomenon that we do actually observe sometimes and we talk about. It's a kind of, it's a cliche in the culture. You know, a husband is, who is too attached to his mother and the wife feels somewhat uh, outshone. You know, she, she can't quite get to him. And then when the mother dies, hopefully there's a kind of movement. There's a translation from that love to the other love, to the, to the, the real love. Um, in this case, of course, Yitzchak is not even married till his mother dies. I don't know if that's better or worse. But, but what it means is that in the natural way of things, he, like all people, has to move from a certain intense involvement with his mother to this, and she is a help then. Rivka arrives and helps to move him away. But Rashi is not really dealing with the gap between the death and the marriage. He's not, he's not actually saying it here. For that, let's have a look at Midrash Agadol, first number one in your page. He was comforted after his mother. The rabbi said it was three years that Yitzchak was mourning for his mother. Now, they give a, they give a number, three years. Uh, what are we being told? The number tells us something, like numbers often do when they're in a, in a story. Right? The storyteller gives a number which means something. What is three years mourning? What is, what is supposed to be one's reaction, if you are familiar with rabbinic thinking? It's too long. It's excessive. Who said it? Yeah. Excessive. It's very long mourning. There is a period for mourning. Right? The legal time is one year. As you know, it's one year for Kaddish. Now, that one year period, it doesn't mean that every, in every human experience it's going to be one year of mourning. In other words, in terms of the inner life, uh, who knows how long it will take get, to get over that first, that first shock, that first loss. Chazal, look, from their experience, understand it for, to be something like a year. And, that, and that's what they say is a sensible. Right? That's when we have to keep the mitzvot of intense mourning. But it remains open. And here is Yitzchak, who has an extremely intense mourning for his mother. And so we're supposed to notice that this is not just the way of the world, that Yitzchak's relation with his mother is something particular, something special. Um, so it was three years, and what was going on through those three years? How did he express his mourning? Here is the first really traumatic expression. All the time, every time he would enter into her tent and he would see that it was in darkness, kohe, he would tear out his hair. Now, that's a gratuitous detail. There's no basis for it in the text. What it means is violent mourning. As you see in certain societies, uh, certain Oriental societies and Middle Eastern societies, where it's extravagant, violent, attacking oneself, you know, actually attacking one's own body to express how deep is one's loss. And here it is in, in the Midrash. Tolhayatolesh besa'aro. And then we continue, and, and what do we read next? But when he married Rivka, <coughs> and he brought her into that tent, the light returned to its place. It was in darkness during those three years, and then the light returned, so something in him is appeased. Is, and then the Midrash Agadol goes on to notice something philological, and says, actually, the word ha'ohela in itself strange form of, of, the, of, the, of the noun for tent, ha'ohela, can mean light. There are contexts in which it means light. For instance, he quotes from Eof, from the book of Job, something about the moon shining. And the word for shining has to do with that root, alef hei lamed. And it occurs to me then, we do talk about an ahil, a lampshade, a lamp you know, in modern Hebrew, uh, ahil, which you could say is a kind of tent around the light. You know, it's a shade around the light. But it doesn't make the shade the opposite of the light. On the contrary, the shade enables the light 
to be seen, to be enjoyed. Otherwise, it would be too much. So there's a feeling there here that a heel is part of light, and it's one of the accessories of light. Yeah? And so here, what you have is a tent that is associated with light for, uh, for Yitzchak, goes dark, and then when Rivka arrives, the light returns to the Ohel, to, to its proper place, as it says, uh, yes, and he saw it as if his mother was still in existence. Ki'ilu imo kayemet. Now that, again, gets a little close to weird. You know, again, it's the idea of her being a, a repeat of his mother, but as, as if his mother were still in existence. Again, the word kayemet, rather than chaya, which suggests that he's in no illusions, that he doesn't really think she's come back to life. Really. It's, it's, not, it's not that kind of weird. Right? That what we're talking about is, and I want to, to say it as, I, as I'm feeling it at the moment, is Yitzchak's sense that when everything is in darkness, when what was light had gone into darkness, a sense that her whole existence had gone under shadow. Her whole existence had been compromised. She didn't have a proper kiyum because of the way she died. That there's something about the way she died that is so traumatic that it traumatizes Yitzchak as well. And he feels as if he's lost his mother in the fullest sense not just because she's no longer here, but because he can't imagine his mother's light anymore. He doesn't, he's, he's lost it. Now that's very traumatic stuff, you'll agree. But it's stuff that we know about. I mean, if I know, then I'm sure everyone knows. Uh, in real life, in literature, uh, we, we know about such things. Some kind of deep note is being struck here, and that's why it says that Yitzchak was comforted after his mother. After he had really lost his mother, he was comforted in his wife, who was a version, brought him a version of what he'd experienced with his mother. Look, what I want to do now is to go into the material, finally, of why and how she died, of which there is no clue in the text of the Torah, except for one thing, which Rashi immediately points out, because he aims however midrashic he's been, his being, he does aim for some kind of local rationality, for local meaning. That if he's going to quote this midrash, he wants to explain why it's sensible to quote it in this context. It's a question of context. So he starts off, it's, this is number three. Avraham came then, we read at the beginning of the parsha, to eulogize Sarah and to weep for her. And the question somewhere is, where did he come from? Where did he come from? Yeah. Okay, Beersheba, but in D, all right, how does Rashi put it here? This story of the death of Sarah is put right next to the Akedah. It's right after. Smichut. Smichut is context. So that's a, a rational question. Why is this story straight after? You can make nothing of that question. You can just say, ah, come on. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to have a deep meaning to everything. You know, and so we had the story of the Akedah, and now we get the next thing along is the, is, is the story of, of Sarah's death. But Rashi doesn't go on that principle. Who was it? Freud said, well, there's no such thing as a coincidence. He doesn't believe in coincidence. He doesn't believe in divine providence either. But he thinks that what looks like a coincidence has some meaning to it. It's put in a, in a story you read about the Akedah, and then you read about the death of Sarah, there must be a connection. And the connection that he singles out, he takes from the Midrash, Midrashic sources, and he, he condenses it, because it was as a result of the news of the Akedah, the tiding, the way the story was told to her, shenizdamen b'na l'shrita, that her son, Nizdamen l'shrita. Now, nizdamen is a very strange word. It's got zman in it. That it was a, a question of timing, of terrible timing, that her son happened upon slaughter. That one meaning of nizdamen is exactly that. Like there was a chance, a, tra a, ch a tragic chance event. And what do you know? Yitzchak was just, you know, merrily going his way. Not even about merrily, but... He would, and suddenly he found himself in Har Maria with his father standing over him with a knife. 
Now, that's a kind of nightmare way of telling the story. That, in a way, it was no, nothing was planned here, but suddenly, that's what happened. Slaughter came upon him. And he was almost slaughtered. The kimat shalo nishrat. Now, that's a very dense phrase, which immediately, of course, raises a question. If she was told the news that Yitzchak came upon slaughter, almost as if he came upon the knife himself, and he was almost slaughtered, then you might say, well, what, you'd, you'd breathe a sigh of relief. That Sarah would be very relieved, right? She'd be in tension for a moment, but then she would be relieved. Why would she die of it? And the idea here is, as Rashi ends here, parcha nishmata lameta. Her soul flew away and she died. Now her soul flew away is, uh, it's a way that the, the Medra, in the Medrash often talks about death or about some kind of a fit that someone has. It means a kind of jolt to the continuity one's, of one's life, a kind of moment of shock, which means that one's soul just takes wing and goes. There's no, there's no solid ground to stand on anymore and, and, and the soul just flies away and she dies. What kills her, actually, according to this? The fact of kimat shalo, the fact of an almost death. Now, again, this is trauma we're talking about. We're talking about a piece of news, a story being told to her in such a way as to give her that sense of all but that her son was all but. Now, what would kill one about that? Again, I repeat, isn't that kind of thing, the kind of thing that usually we're very grateful for? You, know, uh, you are walking down the street and suddenly a heavy object falls from, a, from, a, from the top of the building and lands right in front of you. You know, and you see on YouTube, you see, you see terrible stories like this. That's how we get used to these traumatic uh, things. What are you, what do you, how do you react to such a thing? You may eventually bench Gomel. <laughs> you may eventually go to synagogue, you know, go to Beit Knesset on Shabbat and thank God for a near miss. For, for but what's the immediate reaction? And the immediate reaction surely is trauma. There's a sense of radical shock. That could have been me. One more half step and that was me. That's the sense of chance. That's the sense of, but the, but the odd thing is that nizdamen, which means coming upon in a chance way, an almost death, also comes to mean sometimes in the language of the sages, he was, he, he, he had a, a planned meeting with, in other words, it was all planned, nizdamen. It's the movement of providence in some way. That somewhere it's like you, if it, it can be used for if you have an assignation, if you have a meeting with someone. Someone asks you, what are you doing at 10, 10 o'clock in the morning, you know, in this neighborhood? Uh, you could either answer, well, I have a meeting. I've arranged a meeting. Who's Manti? Yeah. I've, been, I, I, I've, I've got it written down in my diary. Or you could say, well, I don't know. I don't know. And then suddenly realize, you know, what almost happens at that moment. Now, those are very opposite meanings. The idea of chance on the one hand and providence on the other. And I want to be suggesting that both, they're not so opposite, that they're not, they, they can live together some way. And that what, what, what's, what Sarah experiences here is the full shock of the almost, the almost dead idea. And the interesting thing is, well now we'll go look at, at the source Midrashim, at three sources that Rashi is drawing on here, which tell a fuller story. They really kind of fill in the specifics of the story. Who told her about, this, about what happened to Yitzchak? How did they tell? And what specifically was her reaction to, her, to, her, to, the, to this death? Rashi says it very succinctly here. And by saying it succinctly, he really draws our attention to the core of the story, to the problem in the story. The problem of almost which you might think, you know, mathematically, almost is not actually. You know, that means he's alive and everything's fine. You're either alive or you're not alive. And here there is such a thing as almost. Apparently that's also part of, of what happens, an almost. 
the Maharal, in the next passage, uh, tries to, to explain conceptually. Can it wait till the end, or, or is it a question of... Uh, That's also group. That's also a question. Yes. Why doesn't it say Kimat Shanishchad was almost slaughtered? It said it really says almost not slaughtered, which is the opposite. But perhaps, first of all, I think the common sense answer is that that's an idiom. Kimat Shalo is an idiom in Midrashic Hebrew, and it means almost. But what may be the feeling behind it is that almost not slaughtered and almost slaughtered it's the same thing, in a way. The toss of the dice. The feeling of, it could have fallen this way, it could have fallen that way. And that's the heart-stopping thing. That's the thing, that's the way of, um, that the kind, that's the observation, the sense, that makes one, arrests one, that just stops one in one's path. And Maharal wants to answer, so why, why should Kemad Shalo cause her death? And he, he, he cites some commentaries who say, and he doesn't, he's not, he doesn't want to go that way, uh, who say that it means that there was a tragic, it was tragic timing that she got the news and couldn't, she was so shocked that she couldn't stay alive long enough to hear the end of the story, <laughs> you know? So it's one of those stories where, uh, ironically, she dies before she can hear the happy end. But, but Maharal is not interested in this. You know, obviously that's in a way a kind of evasion of, of, of the point. Um, and instead, he puts it like this. You can see it in the last two lines. But it seems, I think, he says, that it was because she heard that he was almost slaughtered by a little thing, davar mu'at, a slight margin stood between her, uh, between her son and slaughter. That is a only a, sl a slender, a, a thread was between slaughter, her, her son and slaughter. Lefichach uh, Therefore, and here is her reaction in an emotional word, Bahala. Bahala is panic, uh, shock, a traumatic response, which means in some way not being able to continue breathing, not being able to, no sense of control over the world. One's got a sense of, of any kind of control of meaning, a sense of, of, of purpose goes when you suddenly realize what life hangs by, that it hangs by a thread. And that Bahala, Ram Maharal again describes it as Derek Eretz. He, he talks about it, he doesn't use the expression, but he describes it as psychology. Just, just look around you and look at your own experience. What do you feel when you, when you have such an experience? And then he goes and applies it to Sarah, on that basis of empirical experience, derech adam liyot nifhal, it's a way of a person to become disoriented in this way, to be thrown into vertigo, when he hears that by a slight thing, such a thing happened. That, that slightness on which one's life can depend is what she dies of. And Maharal wants to take the paradox and put it fully out there, without any excuses about it. With this, let's look at the very difficult graphic material of the Midrashim that Rashi is drawing on. Now, he's certainly drawing on number five. That seems to be the clearest one. But it's a little too clear. Uh, number five, Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer. Let's look at it quite quickly. When Avraham came back from Mount Moriah, the anger of, that's a, that's a name for Satan, Anger, Satan was furious. Well, I don't know who else was furious, but, um, but certainly Satan was furious in the, in the Midrash. He was furious because he had been foiled of his desire of his heart, which was to prevent Avraham from passing the test. In other words, you have a whole cluster of Midrashic sources that have Satan trying to tempt Avraham under different guises not to go to Har Maria. You know, to break off his journey, not to do it, not to. And uh, he doesn't, hasn't succeeded, and he feels thoroughly frustrated. You know, it's almost like a folk tale way of telling the story. He is thoroughly frustrated, and then he thinks, um, what did he do? He went to Sarah. He thought perhaps he'll have better luck with Sarah. 
And he says to Sarah, a man is Sarah, have you heard what's been going on in the world? So he appears to Sarah, not, of course, as Satan. I mean, Satan never advertises his identity. Um, he c appears as some anonymous person, a passerby, chatting. And he says, um, chattily, you know, have you heard what's been going on? And she says, no. And I can't help hearing a certain tension even in her answer. That she already senses that she's dealing with something serious. Um, love. And he says to her, well, you know, Avraham took Yitzchak, his son, and built an altar, uh, his son, and slaughtered him, and offered him up on top of the altar as a burnt offering. Now, that is the satanic narrative. No kimachalo, as if it really happened. Uh, in fact, I think there's two words missing. He says, he's in, in, in what you have on your page, uh, Satan says, uh, your, hu your old husband, Avraham, Yes, Baale Hazaken. Your your old husband took Yitzchak, and which immediately, of course, gives you the satanic quality of what he's suggesting to Sarah. You know, it's a terror about Abraham, who killed his son. Now, it, but he hasn't finished the story yet, and he describes Yitzchak's Yitzchak's reaction at the moment of slaughter. And the child, the boy, was weeping and wailing. That's going to be the, an important word. Because he is, he's not being saved. In other words, he's crying out for help, and he can't be helped. There's no one there to help him. So it's the unbearable moment you know, in Sarah's imagination, which the devil... <laughs> puts into her mind because he wants to turn her mind. He wants to, to undo her. And he makes her imagine the unbearable thing of her son crying for help and who should give help if not her. In other words, why wasn't I there? You know, it's very clear. How do we know that? From the uncanny way the Midrash continues, immediately she began to cry and wail. That is, she imitates, she mimics what she imagines of her son's death and the, 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 the anguish that she wasn't there. And she imitates that in her moment of death. She feels the same sense of a, of a, of a beyond bearing situation, beyond any bearing. And, and then the Midrash ends with this statement that she, she cried and wailed three sobs corresponding to the three sounds of the shofar, tekiah, and three yivavot, yilalot, uh, corresponding to the three yivavot, and her soul flew away and she died. Now, it seems to me there's some kind of confusion here in the text of the Midrash. Uh, there's tekiot, and then there's, there, there, there should be truot here, because really the yivavot, the sobbing sound of the shofar, is the trua, is the broken sound of the, you know, tekia is a long, solid sound. And the trua is the, is, the, is the jagged, broken one, like sobs or like wails, you know, something that you know, go, goes beyond the voice in a way. And that's really the point of this, of this midrash, that she, she dies with that kind of wailing, yalala, which is the sound of the shofar. When the shofar is called, when Rosh Hashanah is called Yom Trua, um, I think it's the Targum or, or the Abu Draham, one, one of the classic commentaries says, translates trua as Yilala, yom yivava, or that it's a this the sound is the sound of wailing. That's what we're supposed to think about when we hear the sound of the shofar. And what the midrash is calling into play here then is an alternative tradition for why we blow shofar on Rosh Hashanah. And it's quite shocking. It's quite a startling connection that's made. It's not the ram. You know, and that it turns up after things are over. It's in the middle of things, right at the crisis moment, Sarah's reaction to her son's crisis moment, that we remember on Yom Kippur, and we do that, that God should remember for us Sarah, and there should be a kapara. There should be some kind. It should act as an atonement. That is, we make the connection in the middle of the tefillah, 
of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a din, it's a law. But nevertheless, it depends on us. What, because of something we want. We want to evoke Sarah. Why would we want to evoke Sarah in this, in a way, meaningless moment? I want to say that the yalala, uh, yalala, the howl or the wail, is a way of expressing meaninglessness. It's a hollow sound. It's the sound of the jackals in the desert. You know, it's yalel, but betohu yalel yishimon. It's a, it's three words in Sefer Dvarim um, about the wilderness, what the wild, what the wilderness that the people have lived in, what it's like. That it's full of the sounds of the wailings of jackals, of howling of jackals. In other words, that's where the Torah was given. The Torah was given in in a world of of meaninglessness, of chance, of contingency. And, and the full edge of that comes out in the story of Sarah. And we evoke that of all things on the most intense, on the, moment, on the day of the year, and the most intense moment of that day in which we are looking in somewhere to rise above, think to, to, to move beyond our, and instead it seems we go down into the heart of it. We go down into the heart of the human experience in a way that can't, on the face of it, be called religious. You know, this, is not, this is not a religious moment. It's not obviously a moment in which God is present when, when Sarah dies. And yet, and you find the question asked and, and, and engaged with in many sources, we don't criticize Sarah. Did she, do, did she do something wrong in dying in this way? You might almost say, where is her faith? You know, there is a tendency to ask questions like that. Where is her faith? Where is her belief in God? Was she not told it was God's commandment? That, uh, that, that Yitzchak be sacrificed. It's true, of course, that Satan is not going to go to the trouble to tell her that it was God's commandment, because that would help her, perhaps, somewhat. But instead, you get the full starkness of a human reaction and a, woman, a mother's reaction to, to this kind of... Uh, and it's un, unmitigated. Right? It's, it's not softened in any way. It's not given a, a wash of paint of, of, of any kind. But at least it's clear why she died. In this version, it's Satan and Yitzchak is dead. So I can understand then that the sh knowing that he's dead would drive her. But what about the next version of the Midrash where he's not dead? What would make her cry there? Number uh, eight, Midrash Tanchuma. Oh, incidentally, if you want to glance at number six, uh, you can see the Pasuk from Hoshea in which the word yalala is used to describe how the people are wailing upon their beds instead of crying to me in their hearts. There's a distinction made there. God criticizes the people in the time of Hosea, and he says they're not crying to me in their hearts, which means praying to me in their time of trouble. Rather, they're wailing on their beds, and the commentary below says that means they're denying providence. So you see that somewhere there is a kind of common sense, a tradition, that the word yalala means it's, it's a meaningless wail. It's a wail at meaninglessness. It, it cries out about, about, it's a cry about meaninglessness. And in Hosea, the people are criticized for indulging in it. But Sarah is not. Sarah is, in some way, Sarah, in a way, goes beyond. He push, she pushes the, the wail beyond to a point of truth that means that she be, remains a resource for the people, that the people can call on her in their own moments of beyond language. Now, the Yalala, as there's something else I'd like to say about the Yalala before we, we go on to the next Midrash. Um, the, uh, there is a, a book called Ecolelias, a strange title, uh, by uh, Daniel Heller Rosen in which, at the beginning, he talks, one of the things he talks about is the early life of the human infant, in which there is, as you know, babble. We call it babble, right? baby's babble. But as we noticed by linguists, uh, Roman Jakobson uh, is the source of this idea that we're coming up with, it's been noticed that this babble contains all the sounds of all the languages of the world. Now, I haven't actually listened and heard this, um, somehow when I'm looking after babies, I, I, this doesn't seem to come to mind. But, um, but, uh, but it's an interesting idea that really b babies have a kind of universal range, sonic range, 
at the beginning of their lives. And then when they reach the apex of Babel, they're, kind of, they, they're really full of it, suddenly there's some kind of stop. They falter. They no longer are able to do that anymore. They lose it. And then they acquire language. That's the point at which they leave behind all that shapeless sound making and they compromise with the world, <laughs> you might say. They enter into the world. It's really quite useful to be able to say something that everyone will understand, everyone around you. And so you go into the narrowness of language and you lose all those other sounds that could have led to other languages, that could have, who knows. Now, it's a very, it's a very evocative idea. And he goes on to say this. But there are moments where there are echoes within the range of ordinary language. There are echoes of that primordial condition. And it comes in the form, he says, of, of uh, interjections, exclamations. Um, in Latin, it's a hue, H-E-U, the word for alas. It doesn't, the word doesn't mean anything suddenly you get a kind of scream of some kind, a primal scream that has, a, it, it's a certain, it's yalala, like, let's say in Hebrew, but what it is is a breakthrough from that primal stratum. And it's extremely intense. When you want to convey in a story or in a drama extremely intense feeling, then in a way you go beyond language. You no longer have someone talking about how they feel, but actually doing it, doing that primal thing. And Dante, apparently, who knew, Dante uh, has, has a book about language, his theory of language and poetry. And he, he there says that human language becomes possible only because of these exclamations. Now, that's a paradoxical statement. You know, that once there are these, that's how language can really start. Once there is a, a sense of the most intense level, at which I can speak, that I, there's something I could do about that, and then I'm willing to, to come down into the world and, and to talk ordinary language. Um, I think immediately of King Lear, of the end of Lear. Do you remember the shock ending of Lear? Do you remember? We're all set for a happy ending, right? The, the, bad, the bad people have been, have been defeated, and a reunion between Lear and his daughter Cordelia is all set up, and then uh, Edmund, Satan, uh, has his last fling and kills Cordelia. And so there's a satanic moment, and Lear comes on stage carrying Cordelia's body, and he cries out, howl, 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 howl. Now that's written into the text. It's not a stage direction that he should howl. It's as if, now someone suggested to me in another class, now, that could be a kind of onomatopoetic. It's an, it, it is a direction, you know, to do that thing. Ow, ow. You know, it, it, as close as you can get in the written text to telling the actor how to act it, actually to howl. And so here you have like an animal howl. And, and, uh, as, uh, and then he continues in words. From there he moves into words. And he says, and my poor fool is hanged. No, no, no life. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life, and thou no breath at all? Thou'lt come no more. Never, 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 never. Five times never. No, no, no life. Now, the repetitions are the same kind of thing. Atva yalala in itself. You repeat a word often enough, and it loses all meaning. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't say anything. It just howls in some sense. And tears come into your eyes at that moment. You know, at that moment, you, you can't not cry. You know, when you see language failing and something, something else, an intensity coming through. Now, this howl, the yalala of Sarah, I think has something of that status. And that's the way it's discussed. When, it, when people talk about it, it has a place, strangely, at the heart of prayer. At the heart of crying to God, there is a room, there's room for the yalala, Sarah's yalala. How is that? How do you imagine that? What, 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 how could you make sense of that? Let's have a look at the, ne at the mid next midrash <coughs> and see if it takes us any further. The next midrash is in number uh, eight, Midrash Chanfuma. At that time, 
Satan came to Sarah. We're still with Satan. And he appeared to her in the, in the guise of Yitzchak. Ah, this is different. He comes looking like Yitzchak. Mm. When she saw him, she said to him, My son, what did your father do to you? What does that tell us? She sees him alive. She sees her son Yitzchak. Why does she ask, what did your father do to you? What, what are you being left to imagine? This is a traumatic story for us to read because we hear her question. There must be something uncanny about how he looks. He looks traumatized. He looks as if something shocking has happened to him. And so she asks in a motherly way. It's a very, you know, but it's a motherly way, but it's not a wifely way. You know, it's suddenly there's this feeling of division uh, between her and her husband. What did your father do to you? And he said to her, and this is the classic story in the Midrash, very quickly, my father took me and he took me uphill and down dales and he brought me to the top of one mountain and he built an altar and he arranged the, the, the setting there and he put up the wood and he bound me on top of the altar and he took the knife to slaughter me. And if it had not been, listen to that, if it had not been, that God had told him not to stretch out his hand, I should already have been slaughtered. Kvar hayiti nishchat. This is in the first person now. This is not a story about someone. This is Yitzchak standing and saying, I am almost slaughtered. I'm alive, but I'm almost slaughtered. How alive can I be at this moment? And there is that word, ilule, which exists in Hebrew but doesn't exist in English, for a situation in which you want to say, if it had not been for something. In other words, the almost situation. We don't have a word, a conjunction, like this in English. Had it not been, you know, it's not the same. Ilu lay, ilu with lay at, at the end of it. You know, if, it's a whale in itself, isn't it? It's a yalala in itself. It's got those sounds in it. And it expresses the Yalala situation, that sense of meaningless contingency. Just at the last minute, you know, a voice called out from heaven and stopped. Otherwise, I should already have been slaughtered. And here is Sarah's reaction then. He, he didn't manage to finish the story until before her soul left her. As it says, Abraham came. And here we don't hear about the shofar. But we hear about, in a way, the, the connection between Ilule and Yalala that the Yilala is about Ilulei situations. It's about the Kemat Shalom situation. And that that's, what she, that's what she dies of. Go to the third version now, and this is the most difficult. Um, and Vayikra Rebbe. And here we start with, an address, this is the preacher, you have to imagine the preacher, the Darshan, talking to the community now, giving, this is how it's, and in the name of God, that God says, Avraham lo samach be'olami. Avraham did not rejoice in my world, and you want to rejoice? So the audience is being brought into the story now. You know, you think joy is, is, a, is a, a plausible thing in the world, in, my, in this world? Even Avraham did not rejoice. Now, why, why Avraham? Why is Avraham chosen as the type of someone who didn't rejoice? Surely the paradox is, we saw it last week, that before the Akedah, he was the rejoicing, he was the type of the rejoicing person. Yeah. We saw this last week. I've rejoiced and I've made everyone happy, he says. My life has been totally good. And then he finds fault with that. You remember in the Midrash last week, I don't know who was here last week, who wasn't. But that's how the Akedah comes into being, that he thinks he hasn't sacrificed anything. But this is now after the Akedah. And God says, you see, even Abraham, who really thought he lived by joy, he lived on, the, that was his style. And I don't mean style in a, in a frivolous way. One's style is actually a, a very important part of one's being. How, what, what, how one lives, not, not what one does, but the whole the how of it. He lived in joy. And then came the Akedah, and the, the joy is cancelled out. You understand that joy can't be the last word, that there is something else. And so it's, a t it's an attack on the audience. You know, the audience is shocked by this opening statement of the, of the sermon. Of the, and what, how is it backed up here? Well, the, the story. 
Abraham finally had a child at 100 years old. And in the end, God tells him, take this child and sacrifice him. And then there's a long story told about his journey to Haran Maria. I won't look at it all with you because I'm trying to, to, to come to the end of, of, of the dying story and to say something about the marrying story. Um, but what happens uh, at the end is that they go, the whole story of going uphill and down dale at the top of a mountain and preparing to slaughter him. The ilule, and again, if it had not been that an angel called out from heaven, he would already have been slaughtered. This is what the preacher is telling the community. That's the story. Now you understand why joy is not, not really the thing. Um, and then the Midrash continues. Tedashiken. Um, <clears throat> it's five lines from the bottom in the Hebrew. Know that it really is so. Know that there is truth in my story. How do we know? Because Yitzchak came back to his mother after the Akedah. Now that's a narrative claim. You know, we don't know, have any evidence that that, that happened. And he was the one who told his mother the story. No Satan. Suddenly, no evil intent. There's no one twisting the story. Here is Yitzchak, who presumably doesn't want his mother to suffer. But he's just telling the truth. And he, what he tells makes her interrupt him, or maybe after he's finished, it says, you know, dot, dot, dot. And then she says, are you telling me? And she, she wants to get it clear. She puts it into words. Ilule, if it had not been for that call of the angel, you would already have been slaughtered. And he says yes. And then there are the yelalot. And then she responds with that sound. Shishakolot, six voices, six sounds, corresponding to the sixth tkiot. Now, um, I have a lot of trouble with the tkia here. I don't, I don't I don't know what to say about it. I think there are people who try to say there were different moods. That the, one was a tkia, one was a chua. It seems to me that it's one sound, and it was the yalala. It was the yalala. And what we're talking about here is a single thing. It's, it's one thing. And what you have here is Yitzchak in very truth, standing in front of Sarah, no Satan. And the idea that this is the truth from the mouth of Yitzchak in some real way. And she is facing the truth here, and she actually articulates it. She is conscious enough to actually say Ilule. It's not said to her, but she says it, and she dies of it. So there's some kind of, as if she's incorporated the wordless into some kind of words, and then she dies of it. What are we to make of it? The whole world, I really need to, to move on, so that was a, that was a, that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> um, uh, afterwards, if, if you would like, we can talk. Um, the, the truth of the matter is that the world hangs by a thread. That's what the, that's what the and therefore joy is not exactly appropriate in this world. Tole Eretz Alblima. We have it in our sources. Without, you don't have to go to existentialists or, uh, you know, atheists to, to find this. That God hangs the world over the abyss. What? It's in, it's in Eof, and it's quoted in the Me'ilah of Yom Kippur. At the conclusion, at the closure of the whole period of Yom Noraim, we it's part of a piyut that we, that we say. Tole Eretz al Blima. That there is that aspect of life. And it's shocking, and it's violent. And it means an experience of uncertainty for us. It means that we can never conclusively, you know, understand the whole meaning of things, see the purpose of things. We could never see it whole. Um, the other source that I just wanted to, to gesture at is, um, is, the, is, the, is from the Tochacha, from the rebuke, that terrible passage of prophecies uh, of what will happen t in terrible times for Am Yisrael. What we read there is, In that terrible time, your life will hang in front of you. Right? You'll, you'll see your life in its full uncertainty. And you will not believe in your life. You will not believe. Yes, And you'll be afraid day and night. And Rashi comments on that. What is to hang? Hanging is a way of expressing suffix. When someone is in doubt, where doubt infects one's whole, 
a sense of total uncertainty, radical uncertainty about life. Shema amut hayom, lest I die today. Yeah, there are some people who literally live with that. You know, terrible illnesses, which could at any moment, right, so one, one, one will not know before. And how to, be, how to live like that. And here it's given as a kind of national, a national experience at certain terrible moments of Jewish history. The experience of suffolk. And Sarah now comes to, to emblemize, I don't know, to, to, to symbolize in some way the truth of that dimension. Now, other than traumatizing us, what good does this do us? You know, why, how, how and why can we make use of this? What can this do for us that in any way helps us to live rather than, rather than the opposite? Right? There's the sense of responsibility coming in, you know, the sense of why am I doing this to you and why am I doing it to myself and, uh, uh, and so on. And since we now have just, I hope, enough time, uh, I want to have a quick look at the second story now because it seems to me that what you have is two stories that actually share a deep theme there's a deep theme in common, and it has to do with doubt and the anguish of doubt and uncertainty and of panic, of that panic sense of not knowing where one, where one is in the world. But this is a, a happy story, isn't it? It's the finding of a wife. And so very briefly, I want to come in at the story at a few points that will, I hope, make, make a point. Eliezer, the servant, who's never actually named, comes to the well, and he starts talking to God. Uh, I, I have to say, he really likes talking. Um, he's, not, he's not an introvert at all. Perik uh, Chavdalid Pasuk Yudbed. And he says this. He said, Lord God of my master Abraham. And the previous verse has just told us that he's arrived at the well at the time when the girls are just coming out to draw water. In other words, there's a sense that he's quite canny. He, he's planned. He's in control. He knows that now is the time and now he's, when he, this is his chance. He, now he's going to see the girls and have a chance to make a choice. <clears throat> and now he talks to God. He says, Lord God of my master Avraham. That's who he is. He is the servant of Avraham. He's not identified in any other way. He's Avraham's alter ego. It's not exactly the right word, but uh, meaning he has Avraham's deepest interests at heart. Really why he's here is because of Avraham, not because of Yitzhak. His aim is to get Yitzhak married as a way of doing something for Avraham. We'll see how it, how it evolves. Um, he says to God that, hakre, hakre na hayom. Please make it happen before me today. Now, happen, happenstance. Right? That is apparently the opposite of hashkacha, of providence. Emphasizing there's something contingent and wild and strange. There's going to be a coincidence here. Please make it happen like this, that it is a coincidence, something, some strange meeting of things to, before me this day. And act in loving kindness to my master Abraham. So it's clear what's foremost in his mind. Find the right girl, yes, but in order that chesed should be brought to his master Abraham, that there should be a feeling of love in the world restored to Abraham. And the sense begins to grow on us, it seems to me, that Avram has been, in a way, alienated from his own chesed, from what is strongest within him, that feeling of connection with the world, of love, being loved, love of God. God hasn't talked to him since the Akeda. There's no more interaction. And he has been left with a wife who died of the Akeda in some, in, in some sense. Yitzchak is apparently not really around. And maybe chesed is running dry in, in Abraham's life. Where does that become more clear is after the test, and I'm going to talk about the test in a moment, succeeds, and Rivka is shown to be the right bride. Does, uh, does the servant say thank you to her? Well, it almost verges on rudeness. You know, he doesn't say anything to her, but he bows down and he prostrates himself to God. He turns right round to God, and he says to God, Blessed be the God, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his chesed, his loving kindness, and his truth from my master Abraham. 
thank you, God, for not abandoning your chesed. Now, putting it like that, lo azav, immediately raises the assumption that there has been some kind of abandonment of chesed. That things were looking pretty dark in some way in Abraham's life. His connection with God is in shadows. So it's not only Sarah's tent, you know, as far as Abraham's concerned, he has many wives. But later, not, not yet. Meantime, he's still living in the dark tent in a way. And this darkness suddenly will be counteracted by the fact that Rufka comes home as the bride of Yitzchak, as an expression of chesed. In what sense is she an expression of chesed? What does the test mean? He stands in front of the well there and he talks to God and he says, make it happen like this. That the girls will come out and I will say, please, get, I say to one girl, the girl to whom I say, I'll choose her by, by accident. I'll just approach one girl and I'll say to her, please give me water to drink. And she'll then respond, and also for your camels, I will draw water. Ota hochachta, she will be the one that you have appointed, you have hochiach, mochiach. You have proved, that will be the proof that she is the only possible wife, that she is the one that I was sent to find. And through her, I will know, uva eda ki asita chesed im adoni Abraham, that she will be the means by which I will know that chesed is being restored. Now, one wonders, what, what, how is Abraham going to find a sense of chesed in life by the appearance of Rivka? I mean, what's exactly the connection here? There are two ways of taking the servant's request of God, what, what he says to God. One way, and it's quite a traditional way, I think, is simply to say he's setting up a test, which is a kind of magical test. It's a magical test in which he's saying, I'll say certain words, she'll say certain words, and then I'll know it's the right one. You know, that, now that, the rabbis don't like at all. They dislike it. They call it nachash, which doesn't mean a serpent in this case. <laughs> nachash means witchcraft, divination, you know, black magic. You know, the black cat will cr crosses my path, and I know as sure as anything, you know, what it means and what I should do. You know, certainty. Omens, yeah, you look, you look inside an animal, well, it's a kind of science, you know, it's a pseudoscience. That can't be this, the sages want to say. And they argue, uh, and uh, commentaries argue about it. And, and what comes up in the end is something like this. It sounds very much like Nachash, you have to admit. You know, it has to do with things she'll say. But actually the difference between this and Nachash is, as Rashi says, that if she says those words, if she offers more than what I asked for. I asked just for a drink for myself, and she responds by having one of those swift looks around that, that, that people of chesed have. You know, it's a sensibility of chesed, man or woman. I don't think it has to be a woman at all uh, to have chesed. Uh, it's that look around, that sensibility that understands that if she asked for this, there may be more things she, she really needs, and she just doesn't ask, she can't ask. So it goes beyond the words, that's chesed, you have to go beyond what's actually said. If she is that kind of girl, then I'll know she's right for my master Abraham, for the house of Abraham, as it is, as Rashi puts it. It suits the whole tone of Abraham's life. And, but let me know by her. And here Rashi comes in with an important shift. It's not, I will know for sure because of what's just happened. It's rather a tefillah. Rashi calls it a trina. Here he's beseeching God, please give me that conviction. When she acts in this ethical way, make me realize fully that that means that you are present at this moment. That God is, the, that this is a God moment. It, it, although it sounds just, quote unquote, like an ethical moment. That there are mo ethical moments of grace in which you sense God. And let me have that feeling. Now, that's not asking for a geometric proof. You know, he's not asking for proof. He's asking for the kind of evidence that a sensibility looks for. A sensibility looks for. And indeed, what happens when she comes out uh, is uh, quite a shock, actually, if you read closely. He asks for water for himself, and she gives him water for himself. 
and she doesn't say what she's supposed to say. According to his scenario, she's supposed to immediately say, also for your camels. It's only after he's finished drinking, if you read the story closely, that you see that then she says, and also for your camels. Now, on any magical reading, she has failed the test. She was, it was supposed to be all in one. He had the story flat, and he flattened her that she has to say the right words. That's, that's what will prove it to you. But on the other story, on the ethical story, it doesn't matter if she says it immediately or after she... In fact, it can be made given meaning, the fact that she doesn't want to give him and his animals water at the same breath. That's what some of the commentaries suggest, that she's actually being refined. She says yes, she gives him what he wants, and then she turns to the animals. But I'm suggesting that he must have a very difficult moment when she doesn't say the words. Somewhere there is a feeling, nevertheless, oops, and there is a kind of anguish. There is a kind of anguish of, is it or isn't it? Is she or is she? Or? And that is a kind of hanging over an abyss. There is shock involved in, these, in, the, in such a moment. Is she the right girl? And it's carried out much more fully when after that she starts actually running up and down to the well and giving water to all the camels. I remember Nacham Levowitz to this day, Zechor Dalev Racha, uh, teaching this and saying, do you know how many camels, I mean, do you know how much water a camel drinks? 10 camels, you know, this young girl, how often she would have to run to the well, you know, and, and so on. Uh, but you see, I didn't forget it. She was, she was the top, she was the best. Um, so here, you, and v'ha'ish mishta'ela, and the man, and then it, he's watching her with a strange word, mishta'e. It's the hitpa'el form of the root, as Rashi points out, on your page, um, you can see it in number 11, <coughs> from the root Shin Aleph Hay, which we have a, a, not often in Tanakh, and it means something like Shamam, as Rashi goes on to say, to be devastated, to be desolated, to be somewhere, you know, shocked beyond. Of course, it's the word that was chosen to describe the Shoah. Where did that word come from? It came from Tanakh. And it was a word, a rather unusual word, which is almost like a onomatopoeia. You know, it's almost like a yalala. It has that, that word, sha'a. You know, just show it. Now, hishta, nishta'e. What does it describe, according to Rashi? It's worth your while to perhaps just look through the, the various examples he gives of the words. But in the end, he comes around to say, that's how you should explain the expression shi'iya, shin, al shin alef hey. It's of a person who is bahul, who is in panic, nifhal, who is in vertigo and full of thoughts, who has all kinds of thoughts and no clear thought, no clear certainty at that moment. All kinds of possibilities are buzzing around, and you can die of that. <laughs> you know, there is that sense of, 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 of losing your bearings that is bahala. And he wants to say that that was, that in fact was uh, uh, the servant's condition. He was shohe v'omed b'makom echad, in a kind of devastated way, right? somehow really sh dazzled and, and shocked to see her actually doing it. That she's going up and down and up and down. And, and he's standing there, macharish ladat, silently waiting to know, according to the verse, ha'im hitzliach Hashem darko imlo. Did God prosper his path or not? In other words, suspense. Is she going to decide after two camels that that's quite enough? You know, I think I've shown enough good, 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 uh, goodwill <laughs> here, and I'm getting rather tired. Um, or is she really going to carry it through? So there's a sense in which he is facing a kind. She is traumatic for him. He had a nice, neat story in a way planned. She would say the right words, and then he would know. But he now realizes that she's come up off the page. She is not, she's, not going to, she's not going to subside into a story. And she's got her own way of doing things. And he has to wait to the end to watch her, to see that actually she does it. That what, she, what she says, she does. And so there is that sense of being stopped in his tracks. And almost a kind of violent feeling of giving up his certainties about anything. That he has no notice that when he comes to tell the story to the family, he changes certain details. 
because he thinks that the story will be more effective in letting it, that the family should let her go to get married if he makes it a magical story, a providential story. And so he changes certain details. Uh, for instance, he says that she immediately said the words. Or he says that at the beginning, Avraham had sent him from the beginning to find a wife from, from my father's house and from my family. Avraham didn't, didn't narrow it down that way. Avraham left it wide open. Find a girl from there. That's all I'm asking you, from there. Whereas the servant narrows it down when he's talking to the family because he wants the family to have that nice religious uh, frisson you know, that, that superstitious religious shudder of, oh, what do you know? He happened to talk to just the right girl from the right family at, the right, at that moment as she said the words, and so on. And there's a lot more I could say, but our time is, is swiftly running out. Uh, and I still want to say one or two more things. That shocking moment means that the way the servant is saved from Nachash, he doesn't go the, that crude way of looking for clear proofs, you know, by a coincidence that this is the right girl. What divides what happens here from that kind of scenario, Sforno says on your page, is Tfila. The genre in which he is saying this to God, please make it happen, opening up chants in this way, is the genre of prayer. That he's not telling God the scenario that will inevitably mean certainty. He is asking God to make it happen in such a way that the person who is fit to enter Abraham's house will in fact come out and that I will ask her. Someone, you know, the Hamik Devar actually even says, please make it that the wrong girl doesn't say the right words. <laughs> you know, that, that, that could happen too on the magical scenario. Now, Tefillah is what divides what sounds like a, a witchcraft situation from a, 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 a meaningful situation. What is tefillah? And I want to finish with just one quick observation. When does one pray and why does one pray? What, what is the situation of prayer? And I want to suggest that prayer is always in a situation of inadequate control where one doesn't know enough to guide one's steps, one doesn't have enough information, and one prays to God to make the right decision, and one is looking to, to commit oneself to something, to, to choose in some way, and you know there's no total certainty, and you're feeling the uncertainty, you're feeling the safek, and even the bahala, when you're actually in a crisis of this kind, where suddenly, you know, any, any, any obvious meaning seems to, to go off into the shadows, and there you are just full of random, random possibilities. That is a moment of tefillah, when one turns to God and asks him to, to make a connection between this situation of doubt and an alternative sense of meaning. Now, it's an alternative sense. Let's, by way of finishing, have a glance at the Mea Shiloh. The Mea Shiloh, number 15, uh, and I'll, I'll just paraphrase it loosely. He quotes from a passage in the Gemara in Brachot. It says this, quoting, For this, every pious person should pray to you, O God, le'et mitzo, at a time of finding. What is a time of finding? That it's, the, it's good that a chassid should pray to you, a pious person should pray to you. When? What is the trigger for prayer? A time of finding. What is that? The rabbis discuss it, and one rabbi says, Chad Amar Isha, woman. Now that's a brief way of saying, when you're at the time of finding a woman, right? The matza Isha, so the word to find is, is associated with getting married, when you get married. When you're faced with this crisis, you're falling in love, call it what you want, you're going to make a decision to marry, and you know that that's a situation of suffering. The situation in which you're going to get married, you have to, you're committing yourself to a marriage, is a situation radically of doubt. You should be in some kind of bahala if you, if you had sense. <laughs> you know, maybe you, you are dazzled in some way. There's a sense of, in one way or another, you know you're not in control because you have no idea what you're getting into. 
who may have some, you know, I, would, I don't want to say too much about this, but you understand, you understand why that is one case in which prayer, above all, is, is appropriate. Because it's a situation in which one doesn't hold all the reins uh, and one is very aware of it, if you have any awareness. And that sense of things, uh, the, the son of the Meir Shalom, the Bet Yaakov, will say it in a different way. Uh, he will say, when you get married, you have no idea what the ch how the children will look. Eich yitra'u hayeladim. By which he means something about when you act in the world, when you act, you're not just thinking things, but you're actually doing things in the world. You're making a choice. You're making a decision. You are going right into a field of the unknown. You're going on the whole, I mean, important, in these important. For instance, you don't know what the consequences of this, the, the most ordinary concept, children, right? It's the obvious, the offspring. You can't see them written in her face. You know, you, right? You're faced with her face, and that's uncertain enough. You know, that's mystery enough. That, that invades a person's confidence, doesn't it? The face of the other, the face of another person. Uh, coming, it's not your face, it's someone else's face. And you are committing yourself now to a relationship, and then there are other children. Similarly, one of the rabbis says, no, it's not a woman, it's Torah. I am finishing in just a minute. It's Torah. What's Torah? Well, again, the Bet Yaakov puts it like this. He says, whenever you're about to say a word of Torah, to say Torah, to speak, not just to think. If you're thinking Torah, you can think whatever you like. But if you're going to speak, you have no idea how it's going to be heard. That way, listen to that. It's the same thing. It's not. It's not. I don't exact. I don't know what I'm going to say, which is also true. <laughs> you don't know how it's going to come out. But it's more. How is it going to be heard by people? And that's the responsibility that I began with. How do you tell the story? You should be praying before you tell the story, because of that situation of you don't know what the effect is going to be. You don't know who's in the audience. You don't know, you know, and so on. Now. That sense of what prayer is, is the sense that we have when we bring the shofar into, into the, the Beit Knesset, into the place of prayer uh, on Rosh Hashanah. And the shofar represents the way Sarah died. Right? It's a very radical way of saying something about prayer as what we're doing very hard on Rosh Hashanah. That's what we're, what we're doing. Prayer as engaging on some conscious level even, not just unconsciously, on, con on, on some conscious level with the vertigo of life, with the, the moments in life which are not few, in which one is not in total control, in which one knows that the consequences are way beyond anything that, that normal language can predict uh, at, the, at this point. Um, if you'll bear with me, I just want to read a poem by Szymorska. It's a, you can find it at the end of the Hebrew, and it won't, I think it's a way of saying more powerfully than I can um, something about our theme. Uh, Jim Borska is a Polish poet, she was a Nobel Prize winner, uh, an extraordinary artist, uh, and she writes now post-Second World War. She's not, she's not Jewish. It could have happened, it had to happen. It happened earlier, later, closer, farther away. It happened, but not to you. You survived because you were the first. You survived because you were the last. Because alone, because the others, because on the left, because on the right, because it was raining, because it was sunny, because a shadow fell. Luckily, there was a forest. Luckily, there were no trees. Luckily, a rail, a hoop, a beam, a break, a frame, a turn, an inch, a second. Luckily, a straw was floating on the water. Thanks to, thus, in spite of, and yet. What would have happened if a hand, a leg, one step away, a hair away? So you are here straight from that moment, still suspended. The net's mesh was tight, but you, through the mesh, I can't stop wondering at it, can't be silent enough. Listen, 
how quickly your heart is beating in me. Every phrase is a story, a possible story. It's because you were saved because there was a forest. No, you were saved because there wasn't a forest. There is every, we try to, exp, to, give, to give reasons in language, meaning in language, to the sheer fact of survival, almost. And you have so many different possible scenarios, and really all we're doing is exercising our need to find meaning of some kind, some explanation for, and in the end we are left simply with the two beating hearts. And the beating heart is what prays. <laughs> what can I say? Um, there's no other way I can put it. That, that one prays because one's heart beats. If one had a very quietly uh, ticking heart, in, very regular, maybe one wouldn't need to pray. You know, everything would be under control. But it's because one feels, and it's because one knows more than one can say, that one prays. I'll leave you to mull over that. Um, Shabbat Shalom.